Good everyone, my name is Laura Mallon and I'm a Principal Systems Engineer working here at TALIS Australia on the OneSky programme. So I've been using a Capella now for about four years, focusing on model-based systems engineering techniques to support system of system design. And that's what I'm going to be talking about in the first half of this presentation today. Hello, uh, good day all. My name is uh, Peter Havenga. I'm the team lead of the uh, System of Systems architecture team. Um, and today, really happy to contribute to the uh, Capella Days 2021 together with Laura. Um, I've been working with Thales since uh, 2005. Since 2010, I've been involved in various activities around uh, model-based systems engineering, ranging from innovation to uh, bits and project execution. I joined the OneSky program in 2019. Uh, and I've been looking in together with the System of Systems architecture team on uh, putting in place uh, an efficient way of working uh, using model-based systems engineering. In this uh, talk, uh, which will split up in two sections, uh, Laura will start. She will give you an overview of the OneSky program and the context in which we use modeling. After that, she will share with you the modeling goals that we have been putting in place for this activity and give you an overview of the system of systems model. After that, I will be taking over and dive with you into the engineering environment that has been put in place for this activity, which of course includes Capella. And I will end with some best practices that we found uh, working together as a team. Before I go into the model-based systems engineering approaches that we use here, I just wanted to give you a short introduction of the OneSky program itself to give you an idea of the scale and size of the system that we've been working on. So the OneSky program is the most complex transformation of air traffic management in Australian history and introduces a number of new key features, such as centralised collaborative command and control, which introduces a national approach to the operation of Australian airspace for both military and civil use. It also introduces broad utilisation of workforce, which introduces flexibility for air traffic controllers to move easily between uh, position, working positions, geographical areas and working groups. It also introduces optimised network and flight efficiency, which is where creating a flexible airspace to enable better management of traffic volumes for both military and civil operations. So myself and Peter both work for the prime contractor TALIS on the OneSky programme and we're working on the design for replacing the existing air traffic management systems with an advanced integrated civil and military air traffic management system also known as CMATS. So a bit on CMATS itself. So CMATS is actually going to be deployed across 12 sites in Australia and each uh, deployment consists of over 10 subsystems ranging from air traffic management, voice control systems and also software support as well. There are over 50 external interfaces to CMATS and some of those are legacy interfaces and some of them are new interfaces for things such as surveillance, say from radar systems and also meteorological data. Between those 12 sites there's also data that is shared between those sites and synchronised to support that flexible airspace that I mentioned earlier. CMATS is also going to be rolled out over three incremental phases. So new subsystems, new functionality and new interfaces are going to be introduced at each phase. So given where we were in the program at the SRR stage, where there was a large number of system design work that had already been done. And that meant that we couldn't use model-based systems engineering actually for requirements uh, development itself. However, we saw value in the production of a model that could define how the design actually met those requirements. Given the large number of dependencies that we have here, even at a system of system level, uh, we need to ensure that those are agreed and understood by a large number of stakeholders. So we considered that the production of a system of system model with a defined level of completeness would provide long-term benefits for the project. So I'm not going to uh, go through all the benefits of using model-based systems engineering over standard practices. 
I think really that anyone that's worked on a large scale project that has involved nesting, visio diagrams, Word documents, Excel documents, understands the long term pain and cost of managing alignment and change management of that documentation. So we considered that through implementing model based systems engineering, we could produce a shared model at a defined level of completeness that will provide long -term agree a long-term agreed reference of the system of systems architecture. In order to do that, we defined a set of system modeling goals. So our first main objective was to provide an accurate referenced and available architecture definition that could provide a solid ground for design decisions and for descriptions of the system and subsystems. We also wanted to define how the CMAT solution would be delivered along its life cycle. Now, if you remember earlier, I mentioned that CMATS is actually going to be delivered over three releases, and it's really important for us to understand which subsystems, interfaces, and functions are available in each release to understand how the design develops, and this also then helps support system integration activities. We also wanted to define how the deployment of a subsystem could vary between sites. So for example, if some functionality was available at a military site versus a civil site. One of the other aspects we want to look into was site connectivity. So I mentioned at the start that actually there is synchronization between the 12 sites across Australia. So we wanted to find not just the intra um, subsystem uh, interfaces, but also those between sites as well. All of this would then produce an architecture framework which we could use long term to support engineering change requests. The second main objective was to demonstrate how the system of systems, uh, system systems design actually satisfies the requirements. So I mentioned at the start that at the SRR we had already allocated requirements to uh, subsystems and in some cases to multiple subsystems. So we wanted to be able to demonstrate in our uh, model the actual role of each subsystem in that, in a, in that requirements and that we wanted to do through using, using functional chains. We also wanted to use the model to ensure that the definition of internal interfaces between subsystems was well understood and complete. The main output for us was to actually produce a system design document and we have been doing that uh, using a tool, tool called Mozart, which Peter will be discussing in the second half of this presentation. So now I just want to look at those modelling goals actually against uh, the Arcadia and Capella framework. So as you can see here, our main focus has been on the logical architecture and the physical architecture elements. So all of our system and subsystem definitions external and internal interface definitions, our functional chains, are all defined within the logical architecture. We're also actually importing our requirements from DAWs into the Capella model and allocating them to elements within the model itself. And, and Peter will be discussing this in the second part of this presentation. We are using the physical architecture to define that variation between the subsystems at each site and also the site connectivity, but unfortunately we won't have time to go through that in the presentation today. So one of the main things that's always talked about with model-based systems engineering is defining what is complete, what is your stopping criteria. So we really wanted to define a model that had um, a defined level of completeness. And in order to do that, we have to be very clear on our stopping criteria. So for us and for our project, that was defining all of the internal and external interfaces and exchange items and providing descriptions for all of those elements. It was also very key that those elements were aligned with the functional baseline and with the interface control documents which are managed outside of Capella. We wanted to ensure that all subsystems were modelled as a black box with a set of top level functions only and descriptions for each of those subsystems were provided. We also wanted to analyse all of those 6,000 requirements and couple only those requirements that were allocated to more than one subsystem to a functional chain in Capella and ensure that functional chain was described. So this slide just provides an overview of the logical architecture structure and the elements that we've been using. So when analysing the requirements, we divided up um, the design into a number of 
key capabilities, which were defined by a number of functional chains. So for those familiar with uh, Capella and the Arcadia method, you'll know that a functional chain is made up of functions, functional exchanges, and exchange items. So a few things just to point out here. So I mentioned previously that um, our model had to be aligned with the interface control documentation. So as you can see here, um, we've got functional exchanges, exchange items, and component exchanges that link to that documentation. So we actually have a logical view of our interfaces within the model, which is then aligned with a logical view within that documentation itself. Then each component exchange within the model is actually represents an interface control document, and we allocate our functional exchanges to those component exchanges and those ICDs accordingly. Another thing to note is that we are also using PVMT, so uh, property, the Property Values Management Tool, to do a number of things. Firstly, to um, allocate releases to elements within the model, for example, the component exchange, um, and also to allocate uh, criticality, criticality to functions. As I mentioned previously, we're also importing all of our um, SS requirements, our system requirements, into the model, and we're allocating those to the functional chains themselves. So I just wanted to go into the functional chains um, a little bit more uh, for you. So here we have an example of a requirement and uh, an associated functional chain. Something to note here is that these are just reference requirements and diagrams, they're not actually uh, requirements from our design. So here we have a top level requirement that states that the system shall display to a technical user and the operational user the status of alarm one. And during that SRR period we allocated that to both ATM and CMS. So what we need to do within our system design documentation is actually define the role of those subsystems in that requirement. So in order to do that, the requirement is imported into the Capella model, and we then have created two functional chains to represent that requirement. One functional chain which shows that in order for it to be displayed to an operational user, the alarm one status is provided to ATM and then displayed to an operational user. But in order for it to be displayed to a technical user, that uh, alarm status is combined with a status from sense A and sensor B, combined into a summary system technical status, and then displayed to a technical user for maintenance purposes. So in doing this for our requirements, and this is quite a basic example, but you can then start to show actually the role of a subsystem in that requirement and this fun a functional chain like this would then be exported into our system design documentation. So we're not just using our model uh, to support the production of the system design documentation. We can also use it to provide targeted views, for example, producing system context diagrams for specific releases and producing high-level interface definitions. Through providing a, a defined and agreed framework, we can also support change management throughout the life of the program. So for example, recently we had to migrate an external uh, interface from one subsystem to another. We can use the model to analyse the impact of that, to look at which subsystems, interfaces, exchange items and releases that impacts. And this can be done in a much quicker way than through analysing documentation. We're also able to actually map uh, data through the system. So we have um, an understanding of every single exchange between subsystems uh, within the model. And, so, and that's been used and exported as CSV documents to support gateway design. One of the other aspects is the functional chains have been used to support IVVA and particularly system level integration. The functional chains themselves provide the basis for our system integration test documentation. We've also used the model to support onboarding activities. We output the model as an HTML, which provides a nice interactive source for new starters to learn about the system at, an, at a high level. Okay, so one thing uh, I just wanted to touch on is the fact that uh, given the size of the system that we've uh, described, we actually had uh, up to 10 engineers 
working simultaneously on the model, either inputting data or reviewing information. In order to do that, we actually use the Capella Team version, which allows team collaborative work on a single model in real time. So having lots of people working on one model can be a real challenge. And Capella Team is really good in that it introduces uh, lots of tools um, and techniques to manage change management within the tool itself. And Peter's going to be going into those uh, in the second half of this presentation. But uh, you cannot rely just on the tooling itself. Uh, from my experience working on Capella Team, you also have to make sure that you define clear boundaries of responsibility for your team. For us, that meant assigning primary contacts for different capabilities, subsystems, and interfaces. And what that meant was that when you're working on a section of the model, if you found that you were actually having to modify or change a particular interface that didn't belong to you, you actually knew exactly who you needed to speak to um, in order to understand how that affected the design of the system. And we found that actually that created a much uh, better culture of working within the team. So I'm now going to hand over to Peter who's going to talk through our model-based systems engineering environment and also some of our change management practices. Thank you. Okay, so in this part of the talk we'll be focusing on the engineering environment that have been put in place around uh, Capella. Um, this engineering environment is based on Thales common practices, but those practices always need to be tailored and adapted to the activity at hand. Uh, and that's what I will be showing in this uh, part of the talk. I will start with giving you the context of the engineering environment. First of all, there is the team who is daily interacting with this, uh, this environment. As Laura already mentioned, the ownership of the data in the model is, is really key here, uh, as well as training of the engineers that are working with uh, Capella and Arcadia on a day-to-day basis. So they all have been trained uh, to at least have a good understanding of, of those elements uh, of, of Capella that they are working with. Uh, and there is good day-to-day -day collaboration thanks to the team solution. We'll go a bit deeper into that later on. Uh, second, exports uh, of data. Uh, we do this because there are teams outside of the System of Systems Architecture team that have a need to work with the data from our team, but that are not trained fully on Capella and Arcadia. So we provide the HTML uh, of our model, uh, available to teams that do have uh, some Capella and Arcadia knowledge. And we provide various data exports uh, targeted to those, to that information that is relevant for those teams. Um, other teams and stakeholders are, for example, security, safety, uh, integration activities, verification activities, etc., etc. More in this part of the talk on how we produce those exports uh, later on. And then on the right side, we see the deliverables. Um, these deliverables are contractual documents that uh, we provide to our customer or inputs for those contractual documents. Um, and I will provide more information on how we set this up and how Capella is being used in that later on in this, uh, this part of the talk. What is not visible in this picture and will not be discussed in this talk is the provision of the System of Systems architecture model data to the various subsystem teams. So we have multiple subsystem teams that are responsible for the design of the various subsystems. Some of these teams are also using MBSC in their uh, activities, but I will not be covering that in this, uh, this talk. So in the rest of the slide, I will be opening up this engineering environment and take you to it step by step. First of all, looking at the, uh, the Team for Capella solution uh, that we have in place, um, it's a great solution uh, for working collaboratively on the same model uh, in real time. Uh, I will not provide too much details on that solution. I think the Obeo, Obeo website has great, is a great source of information on what can be done with uh, Capella, uh, Team for Capella, but it has been really key for our activity to be able to work efficiently. What I will be uh, covering a bit more is the import of requirements into the model. As Laura already showed, we use those requirements and we couple them to the functional change in our model. Uh, we use the requirements viewpoint for this. Um, before that, we did this coupling inside doors. So we actually uh, created functional chain definitions inside doors and did the coupling, uh, kept the coupling inside doors. But this was giving uh, uh, problems with maintenance of, of the data in case we created new functional chains. 
And Croatia changed function, uh, functional change. It became really uh, complex to, to keep that data aligned. So we uh, resorted to the uh, requirements viewpoint. And by doing this, we were able to import baseline information from doors containing all the relevant requirements and link them directly to model elements. And this has really made our life much uh, easier uh, and making sure that all the data uh, is staying consistent. Uh, we also want to be covering is change management, which is really key in the current phase of the project that we are in. Uh, everything needs to be driven uh, by change management. So we use Jira for that. Um, inside doors, we have DXL scripts in place that make sure that when an engineer changes data inside doors, he, uh, he provides the change related change key so that we can always can see which changes are related to uh, which change in uh, Jira. We have the same in place for our model, uh, which is based on the, the Mylan solution. Um, so when we look into the change history of the model, we always see which uh, Jira ticket uh, keys are related to which changes in, uh, in the model. So in order to further processing on the uh, team of, uh, system of systems architecture model, uh, we have a need to uh, configure the model inside the configuration management environment. And for that, we have put in place uh, a Git repository. Um, in that Git repository, we regularly create a revision of the model coming from the team server. Uh, so once the team has achieved a certain milestone, certain set of changes have been implemented, uh, we take the model from the team server and we update the revision inside Git. And we use that Git version to do any further processing, being, for example, the HTML production uh, that's made available to, uh, to other teams. Next to the model, uh, we also have in place uh, configuration management for all other engineering artifacts that are relevant uh, in the production of those exports or in the production of the uh, document deliveries. Um, that are, those are, for example, the, the, the setup of the whole engineering environment, so the drop-ins and add-ins uh, that we've put in place for Capella, some generic uh, Word and Excel fragments that we use inside documents, and the document production projects itself. Uh, there's way more data, but I will not be covering that inside this, uh, this talk. And then lastly, there is the documentation generation uh, aspect. So we use uh, a Thales-specific solution called uh, Mozar, which is a tool for documentation publication. Um, when you look at the open source, I think it's comparable to the M2Doc solution uh, that's available, uh, which integrates with, uh, with Capella. In this talk, I will be highlighting how we perform this documentation generation to produce our uh, uh, deliverables. So in this talk, I will not be going any deeper um, uh, into uh, this engineering environment. I will highlight three aspects of it, and that's what we'll be focused on. So those three aspects will be on the right side, uh, documentation generation um, with uh, Mozart. It will be an example of PVMT that we already highlighted in the first section of this talk. And it will be um, uh, focused on the data exports and how we put that in place. Because I think that's a good example of how we extended Capella with some project specific uh, needs. So looking into uh, document production uh, in, uh, in this activity. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we, uh, we use Mosar. Uh, one of the key benefits from this solution is that we can use multiple engineering artifacts as input for uh, our documents. Uh, so not only Capella, also information from doors, information from Word, information from Excel, information from our Jira environment uh, is being used to provide the documents. So in this documentation uh, publication projects, we work on the document assembly. Uh, and the nice thing is that that document assembly is uh, fully derived from the information inside the Capella models. Um, with that I mean that the structure that sits inside the Capella model, for example the relation from uh, capabilities to certain functions, to certain diagrams, is used to set up the structure of the documents. So if we create new functional chains or new functions, they will all be uh, become available inside the documents uh, and the document will automatically be expanded and all the chapter, in, chapter numbering uh, will be updated uh, as we go. So that means that our documents are always uh, a good overview of the information that's captured inside the model. 
Those documents can be generated at any moment in time. So that means that if there is any updates uh, in the model, we just re-execute the document publication and we end up with a new document containing all the changes made into the model. So we put in place continuous integration uh, through Jenkins uh, to be able to do that every time that a new model gets committed into the Git repository. Um, so then the generation is kicked off and the team will have access to the latest version of the document uh, for some verification uh, activities to see if the uh, documents are, uh, are okay. So the uh, second point that I wanted to be covering here is on the model itself. And I will highlight one example, uh, and this example will be around the use of PVMT, so the Property Value Management Tool. Uh, this tool has been uh, greatly uh, explained by Guana Fass in one of the uh, Capella videos, which is available on the uh, Capella YouTube channel. Uh, so I will not be repeating that here. Uh, I will just focus on how we use that in, in this activity. So in our activity, one of the things that's really important is the uh, highlighting of critical operation functions inside the architecture. So critical operation functions are those functions that are deemed necessary to safely land planes. Um, of course, we need to take the necessary precautions in our architecture for these, uh, these functions. Um, so we use PVMT to be able to highlight which of the functions in our architecture are critical operation functions and which are not. Um, and we, next to that, we have put in place some validation rules, uh, which are project uh, specific, uh, which is a project specific extension uh, made in Capella, to make sure that we have 100% coverage, uh, so that we checked all functions in our architecture uh, uh, and defined if they are critical operation functions, yes or no. Um, lastly, what you see here on the right side, we use that information. To be, uh, uh, to be contained in the documents that we produce uh, in the form of, of tables. So the, the third highlight uh, that I want to uh, go into is on uh, data exports. And the reason for choosing this uh, particular example uh, is because I think it's a good example of um, the, the good point that Capella is an open tool which is based on the Eclipse uh, development environment. So it's, it's quite easy to extend Capella uh, with some uh, extra functionality if that is needed. Of course, this required some Java skills. Uh, for this, we, uh, we included uh, a software engineering graduate into our team. Uh, and she has been able, uh, with just a bit of training on, on Capella and Arcadia, uh, to help us in putting in place these, uh, these type of data exports. We tried various other solutions, um, being the mass properties view that's available and a graphical uh, model query solution that's uh, available as a prototype within the Talos group. Uh, but both of these uh, solutions um, um, uh, were not able to provide us with the exact table content that we had a need for. Um, so with uh, this extension, uh, which is really lightweight, we were able to extract certain views on the data in the model, um, and those views are being delivered to other teams or are used for tables in, inside our documents. Uh, one example uh, that I want to uh, highlight here is, for example, a list of functional chains, uh, including all interfaces for each of the functional chains that are uh, uh, involved uh, and which release those functional chains are applicable. That information is really helpful for our uh, integration activities. Um, so this is uh, one of those exports that we put in place that's really helping uh, the activity uh, go forward. So uh, back to the overall picture of the engineering environment. Um, we highlighted three uh, aspects of this. Um, what we did not yet highlight are some best practices that I wanted to share here. Uh, first of all, um, team guidelines. As you see here, um, the environment contains various steps and various actions. Not all of our team members are all 100% mastering all of these steps. Um, but we, with the whole team, we cover all of them. So we have some people that are focused more on documentation generation, others focused more on the uh, requirements coupling part, etc. Et so what's really key is to have good guidelines. We use an internal wiki for that. Um, describing all the steps that are relevant for all of these various actions. And those guidelines, thanks to our wiki, are always kept up to date uh, in, 
in, uh, in case there are things uh, changing, in case there are improvements being put in place, we always make sure that those guidelines are up to speed. These guidelines are also really key in onboarding of new engineers into the activity. Second point that I want to highlight is knowledge sharing. Um, as I mentioned, not all team members are 100% uh, mastering all of the details. So what we put in place is uh, weekly knowledge sharing sessions of, of one hour um, in which we focus on a particular uh, area. Sometimes it's uh, domain specific, so we look in, into certain air traffic management concepts uh, and use the, some diagrams in the model to explain them to, uh, to each other. Sometimes we are looking more into engineering uh, process steps uh, or things that recently changed or got improved. Um, thirdly, there's the engineering support. It's really important, uh, in my opinion, when you use Capella um, uh, to have proper engineering support. You want the engineers in the activity to be able to focus on the engineering and not on the tools or the engineering environment. So to do that, you need to have in place proper engineering support, which uh, should be looking after, for example, the infrastructure and availability of the applications, uh, logins, getting the engineers uh, the required tools. Um, our engineering support team uh, has been helping us a lot. Um, they also perform, for example, regular updates of the, uh, the requirements inside our model. Um, they help us in, in baselining certain information at certain moments in time. Um, so it's really key to have that engineering support in place to be able uh, to let the engineers focus 100% on the actual engineering activities. Uh, and the last point that I want to mention, um, which uh, has been really key, is regular retrospectives. Um, every regular uh, interval, we, uh, we had a team retrospective in which we sat down, looked back at the past period and looked at, okay, what are the things that are going well and what are the things that we need to improve upon. And this really helped us to improve some bottlenecks uh, and, and to improve, improve the day-to-day -day activities. Uh, one of the examples um, is, for example, this, these data exports. That's something that was the direct effect from a retrospective. Also, the effect that we are now maintaining the, the coupling of requirements to model elements inside the model, and except of doing that inside doors, is the outcome of one of those uh, retrospectives. So, um, really key to have them regularly and to act and uh, put actions in place coming out from those uh, retrospectives. So that's all that I uh, wanted to cover in this uh, second part of the talk. Um, this brings us to the end of the talk. Uh, I want to thank you a lot uh, for your attention.